If you're able, please stand. We're going to read Luke 14, 1 through 24. It's on page 927, if you have a Bible from the back. One Sabbath, when he went in to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent, and he took the man, healed him, and sent him away. And to them he said, Which of you, whose son or ox falls into the well, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They could find no answer to these things. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the place of honor because you're more distinguished per- because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in humiliation you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you arrive, go and sit in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher and you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, When you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lamed, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous." When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is the one who will eat bread of the kingdom of God. And he told him, A man was giving a large banquet and invited many, and at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, Come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married, and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then, in anger, the master of the household told his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city, and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, and there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the highways and hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who are invited will enjoy my banquet. You may be seated. So at times like this, Um, we can often start asking the question, uh, is this the end times? I mean, it's Israel. And my, my answer to you, and I believe Scripture's answer to you, is yes. And you've heard me say before that when Jesus lived, died, rose again, and ascended, that began the end times. We have been living in the end times for 2,000 years. And so the truth of God and the word of God and the spirit of God that has sustained the church for the last 2,000 years is the same spirit of God that's going to sustain the church tonight and tomorrow, next week, next year, until the Lord returns. Amen? And so these things are disturbing and unsettling, and we should lament them, we should watch, and we should pray. It should drive us to our knees, but it should not drive us to fear. Amen? Amen? We have been in the last days. He has told us what to expect, and he has promised that he will never leave us or forsake us, that he's coming again, and we know the end of the story. And so as you listen to talk radio this week, as you watch YouTube, as you listen to podcasts, as you have conversations, remind yourself of these things, okay? That nothing's changed in that sense. He's still on the throne. He's still returning. He's still the king of the universe who holds all things in his hands. Nothing has changed in that regard. And so we look to him, we cry out, we lament these things, but we also do so with hope, 
knowing that he will return. Amen? Amen. And so we look to his word today that is just as true today as it was 2,000 years ago and will be just as true tomorrow. And I appreciate Casey reading it for us. And so in chapter 14, we see basically these four little scenes, these four little segments. And there are various segments that kind of take place at a dinner party. And some people think that Luke kind of pieced these together from different times in Jesus' ministry over the three years and that he kind of put them all together. But as you read through here, I mean, that could be, but it doesn't seem, number one, unlikely that this all happened at the same dinner party. How many of you have had dinner parties that just kind of keep going and going and going? It's like, I can't believe that happened next. Seems to be one of those things. But as we dig into it a little deeper, I think it seems more and more likely that this is the same dinner party, okay? And I think you're gonna see that for yourself. And if you didn't pick up on it yet, there are some really awkward moments during this dinner party. Like super cringy awkward, like mm, I'm gonna go to the restroom now and get lost in the house for a while. And so I want you to use your imagination because this really happened and I want you to picture and put yourself in this scene because I think it will make a little bit more sense as we go through it. So it says one Sabbath, so that was their holy day. That was their, like we come together on Sunday, they came together on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. One Sabbath when Jesus went in to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. And so history tells us that Sabbath dinner was kind of a big deal. And it was often, it would take place after you went to synagogue or after you went to worship in the temple, you would have a big meal that you had actually prepared the day before because you couldn't work on the Sabbath, right? And so you put all this work and labor into making a big meal. And it kind of reminds me of an old school Sunday lunch or dinner after church. I don't know if you grew up in church or maybe you grew up in a, in a tradition where Sunday dinner was a big deal. And it was an even bigger deal if you had a special guest or guests coming over. Maybe this played out in your house where maybe the pastor and his family was coming over or maybe the guest speaker from church that day was coming over or maybe that new family that's been visiting the church, you finally got up the courage to invite them over to the house. And what happened? Mom was going crazy the day and night before, cleaning the house, getting everything ready, cooking a ton of food, right? You couldn't sit on the couch because you might mess it up. And then she get out the really nice china or the nice place because it was Sunday dinner and we had special guests coming over. And so this is kind of the feel here. And so Jesus is invited over to, who's, whose house is it? It's a Pharisee. What kind of Pharisee? Leading Pharisee. <laughs> that means the big dog Pharisee. Like this wasn't your run of the mill Pharisee. This was a guy with position and authority. He had clout, he had weight. And so we know at this point that the religious leaders already hate Jesus. They're plotting to try to get rid of him. They've been trying to trap him and trick him for a long time to get him out of the picture, but they haven't been able to do it and they keep fumbling all over themselves. So I think what we see here is this leading Pharisee saying, you guys are a bunch of imbeciles. I'm gonna have them over to dinner. I'm gonna take care of this. Why do you think that? Well, Jesus arrives at this dinner party after synagogue, a bunch of more distinguished guests in the house. He's looking for a spot around the table, looking for his little name card maybe, and as he finds his seat, he looks across the table and it says that everyone is watching him closely. And for us looking at it, as we followed him for many, many chapters now, we're like, it's a trap, Jesus. They're all like, they're watching him closely. It's a trap, it's a setup. And so Jesus finds a spot and he looks across the table and look at verse two, what happens? There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. We have a picture of this guy. I'm really sorry, I don't mean to make light of it, but when I read that, that's what came to mind. I'm sorry, I'm really immature. It's a heavy day, little, let's lighten the heart a little bit. But this condition is most likely what we know as uh, edema or more commonly called dropsy. You can take the picture down, it's okay. They're enjoying that in the back. There's a bunch of middle schoolers in the back, they love it. 
That's how I keep them paying attention. You guys are awesome. But it's a condition where, where swelling in the body is caused by your tissues, your body's tissues holding on to water. And again, it can be just in an ankle or an arm or whatever, or it can be your whole body, and it is incredibly painful, as you can imagine, and maybe you've experienced that. And so there's this man right in front of him that's suffering, and so now it definitely feels like a setup. Think about it. Leading Pharisee has Jesus over for Sabbath dinner. Other distinguished people are in the house, but he just so happens to have this guy who's really in a lot of agony and pain. That's not somebody you would invite to your dinner. And I don't think that guy's getting in there uninvited, leading Pharisee. In the language around it of, they were all watching him, then there right in front of him was this guy. And then look at Jesus' response. This kind of tells us like this was a setup. In response, she's like, I see what's going on here. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, He's going to diffuse the situation really fast. He's going to foil their plan. They've, they've put him in this situation to see if he'll break the law again. We've already read where he's healed people on the Sabbath and it freaks them out and they lose their minds about it. So they're setting them up again to see if he'll do it again. We've clearly told him you can't do that and let's see if he does it again. Then we've got him. We'll trap him. And so Jesus sees the man in front of him. In response, Jesus asked the law and the experts and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, the question is brilliant because if they say, yes, it's lawful, then it breaks their scribes' interpretation of law. That's what they've been upset about. Like, no, our interpretation of law is you can't do that. If they say, no, it's not lawful, they deep down know that's incorrect because Moses never explicitly said you couldn't heal somebody on the Sabbath. And their, their interpretations even did allow for certain instances when you could heal somebody if they were suffering really, really bad, if it was like life-threatening. So Jesus, by turning it on them, the question on them, he kind of puts them in this thing where either way they answer, they're gonna be exposed for the hypocrites that they are. And so how do they answer? Verse 4, but they kept silent. Ever gotten an awkward no answer? Super awkward. And so Jesus took the man, healed him, and sent him away. I love it. It's just like a throwaway sentence. (laughs) But what they had intended to use the man for, Jesus meets the man. He takes care of his need. He heals him and says, okay, you can go. You don't have to stick around for this. This is a joke. This is going to get messy. You can go home. Nobody else is going to exploit you here. Verse 5. And to them, meaning to the rest of the guests that have apparently set him up, Jesus said, Which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? So again, he puts the question on them, like, really? Any of you that wouldn't do the same, even for your animal? Like, come on, guys. How do they respond? Verse 6. They could find no answer to these things. Another awkward non-answer. He's caught them in their little trap and in their little game. And so you got to imagine, use your imagination right now. This has just gone down like you got the marshmallow man and Jesus healing him and making the host and the other guests feel, (laughs) that wasn't planned, feel super awkward, well played. Um, And you got to think, like, the host is probably like, okay, let's just eat. Like, this is awkward. Everybody find your space. Let's get to the table. Let's eat. Oh, food's ready. Right? Like, to break the awkwardness. Everybody come to the table. Well, history tells us that Jews of this time, and you maybe know this, ate at a really low table. And they would have these couches that sat about three people, and they would put them in a U-shape around the table. Okay? And so you would recline at the table on your left elbow with your legs pointed out and three people would be on one couch. And so if you imagine a U-shaped table, at the bottom of the U, that couch was the coveted couch. It was the position of authority. It was the head of the table. And the spot you wanted was the middle seat at that point. And then the couch to the left was like the second position. And the couch to the right was the third position. So everybody knew according to the custom and and just what was going on, where the best seats were. 
And this is like a dinner party for the who's who of the, the town. And so Jesus is watching people pick their spot. He's watching this whole thing go down in this awkward dinner. And he's observing how they're choosing their seat. Verse seven, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. <laughs> it's like, oh, interesting. All right. And he just calls it out. He calls it out and speaks to everybody. And he says this. He says, when you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, hey, give your place to this guy. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so this is a shame and honor-based culture. You didn't want to be publicly embarrassed. And Jesus, in one sense, is throwing them a bone like, guys, what are you doing? Like, this is, this is just stupid. Like, you're setting yourself up to be totally embarrassed in front of everybody. Like, don't do that. But he's getting at something deeper. It reminded me, yesterday, we went to a cross-country meet for one of our kids. And at the end of each race, the announcer would say, if you believe you finished in the top 25, come up to the trophy table. And we were, the dads were joking like, I believe I finished in the top 25. But I'm like, if you're a kid and you're not really sure, like, I think I made it in top 25, do you really want to be the kid that goes up to the table and they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you're 26? Wouldn't you rather them come looking for you like, hey, Johnny, you actually made it in, you're 25? Anyway, it spoke to me. Um, And so he's calling them to humility in a really practical way as he sees their lack of humility in a really practical way come out, right? He sees them like jockeying for position, like children. He says, stop trying to position yourself ahead of others. And Paul will later put it this way in Philippians 2. You're familiar with this passage. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, like he always gets the best position, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Other translations say grasp, but exploiting the position that was rightfully his for his own gain. Jesus didn't see it that way. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had become as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him. So Jesus has just called them out in front of each other for their own arrogance and pride. And then he turns to the host in front of everyone and says this. Look at this, verse 12. Jesus also said to the one who invited him, and by the way, dude, when you give a lunch or a dinner, Don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors because they might invite you back and you would be be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Is Jesus saying you can never have your friends and family over? No, he's getting to the heart of the issue. This guy was posturing and positioning himself having all the rich and famous and influential people over, seeking to embarrass and trap Jesus in front of them all, which would make him look even better. It was one element of what was going on. But don't just do nice things for others so that they can return the favor. If that's your motive, that's not generosity, that's not kindness, that's not love. It's actually self-seeking and you are taking advantage of others. We see at the end there that he points once again, as we've seen over the last few weeks, to the reality of eternity and of judgment. Because he says that the resurrection of the righteous, you'll be repaid. That there is an afterlife and eternity to come and you will be living in it if you are righteous. We're to live our lives with greater perspective, okay? So remember the people that are around that table, right? The influential, the wealthy, the famous And Jesus is like, man, you should have invited the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. He says that in front of everybody. Like, you all shouldn't be here. 
dude, you should have invited other people. So the awkwardness just continues. He goes from one awkward moment to the next. But it's not Jesus' fault that this is happening. He just loves them enough to tell them the truth of what he is observing coming out of their hearts by their actions. They're telling on themselves and he's saying, guys, do you see what's happening? Do you see what you're doing? And so I love this. One guest just cannot handle the awkwardness. Are you that person? You just can't handle when it gets awkward and so you just do something? He can't handle the awkwardness and he self-righteously blurts this out. Look at 15. When one of those who reclined at the table heard Jesus saying these things, he said to him, "Uh, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Like, lucky for me, I'm gonna be there. (laughs) Let's eat, let's dig in. And so Jesus stops Everybody's mid-bite, and he tells another parable as if to say, like, hey, dude, don't be so sure you're going to be there. Verse 16, then Jesus told him, a man was giving a large banquet and invited many, and at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. Now, this was customary to have two invitations. One was an initial one, kind of like the save the date, like this is going to be happening, but then it took a long time to prepare a big banquet and feast in their culture, and so you would get a second notification, be like, all right, game on, it's ready, come on down. So it's implying that everybody had responded to the first one, like, okay, we'll come, and so when the guy, the servant goes out to tell them, all right, party's ready, come on in, look at what happens in verse 18. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, "Uh, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. I I, I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I, I ask you to excuse me. And then another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. So with excuse after excuse, they refused to come. The Jews were God's chosen people. They had made the guest list and got the initial invite. And they said they were all in. And for generations, they said, we're all in, we're all in, we're all in. And when the master sends the messenger to say, come on in. But they would not. They bailed. And they let lesser things and other expectations get in the way. And so what does the master do? We're almost done. So the servant came back, verse 21, and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Do you see how this is all the same occurrence that day? All of these things go together. He just told the host, this is who you should have invited. And now he tells this parable about when the rich and the wealthy and everybody else turns their back on the party, he says, go invite everyone else who was overlooked. Bring them in, bring them in. But then look at what happens. He says, bring in all the fringe, overlooked, unimportant people. You know, the people that you didn't want around this table today. Invite them in. They're the ones that should be here. And so the servant does that. But look at verse 22. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. And guess what? There's still room. This is a really big banquet. We've got more space. What are we going to do? Verse 23, then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. What he says is go out into the furthest reaches, to the homeless, to the criminals, to the prostitutes, to the Gentiles, to the dirty people that you call dogs, that you would never expect to be part of this banquet. Go get them in here. And those who thought they were too good or too busy or too preoccupied to come in won't get in. And friends, again, for the last several weeks, we've seen this twist at the end of each of these sections where Jesus is telling Jews, it is not just about you. I am seeking to bring in people from every end of the earth. Look at 
when we use others, compete with others, consider ourselves better than others, whether it be socially, economically, ethnically, physically, behaviorally, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, intellectually, when we think that we are somehow superior in any way to anyone else, we are putting ourselves in opposition to the very nature of Jesus. In the very invitation of his heart and we are choosing to exclude ourselves from his table. Because to come to his table, we must humble ourselves before him and before one another. Because the truth is, we are all the poor, we are all the maimed, we are all the blind, we are all the lame, we are all the dirty people outside on the outskirts of town that have been broken by our sin. Amen? We have no more and no less worth than the next person because we are all made in his image and we are all marred by sin and we are all in need of of a great savior. Jesus was in his mercy trying to get across to them around that awkward dinner that day. And his message and invitation is the same to us today. And his message and invitation is the same to those people on the other side of the world right now facing eternity as we speak. You are invited in. You are invited in Will you humble yourself and come to me? Let's pray. Confess to the Lord and confess to you that I often think I'm better than other people for various reasons. As I go throughout my day, I think, oh, I would never do that, or oh, why are they dressed like that, or oh, why don't they do this differently? The pride of my heart is exposed on a daily basis in these ways, and that is not the heart and character of Christ. And I've seen it over the last week or so in different scenarios, and I've had to repent for it, and I thank the Lord that he's exposing that in me. The joy this past week of being with uh, other pastors and other leaders from around the country uh, for our annual conference for our church planning network. And the theme of the conference was just the multi-ethnic, multicultural body of Christ around the world. And how are we seeing that reflected in our local churches? And not just by skin color and ethnicity, but socioeconomically, just all across the board, the diversity of the body of Christ is a beautiful thing. And yet I find silly reasons to think I'm better than people who, by all outward appearances, look just like me. But each of us need Christ. Each of us have the same brokenness. And so, Lord, as we come to the table... We thank you for this reminder that the the old preacher said at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We all have the same need. Continue, Lord, to stir and speak to our hearts as we gather at your table. 2 Corinthians 5 says, God reconciled us to himself through Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So as we've talked about the conflict right now in the Middle East, as we know that there is conflict with Russia and Ukraine and different parts of Africa and different parts of Asia today, we as Christ's church have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so in our church service, we give the time for greeting and we greet one another and it's a way of passing the peace. But today we're gonna be real explicit about it. And so if you grew up Catholic, not trying to trigger anybody, but it's scriptural. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ's reconciliation and his peace to one another. So as we leave this place, you guys are gonna do the benediction. I wanna challenge you and encourage you to go to up to at least three people 
and say, may the peace of Christ be with you. We need his peace to carry us through and carry with us as we go throughout this week, amen? Three people, may the peace of Christ be with you.